Since the beginning of human existence, one of the questions that we have faced, of course, all of us is, who are you? Meaning, look in the mirror, who are we? Who do we see ourselves as being? You know, what is our identity? But really, it's not even just a matter of who are you? It's, it's almost as much as which who are you? Because we know we have multiple identities and not a diagnostic sense, but, uh, you know, uh, but we do have multiple identities, multiple ways we express ourselves, multiple cultures that we belong to. So it's which who are you? And even beyond that, it's, it's, it's a matter of which who are you right now? Because that changes over time can change from minute to minute, right? Again, not in a, a psychologically unhealthy way, but just that's who we are as humans. We, we have different identities and, and we know that to be true. But, but one other aspect of all of this is that identity is closely intertwined with a culture. Right? Identity and culture are constantly influencing one another, affecting one another. And, and there's this constant interchange taking place between identity and culture. So as we examine um, intercultural communication and, and work to improve our intercultural communication skills, it is important that we uh, explore how that is influenced by and how it influences the self and our identity. So thinking about who we are, how does culture play into that? And how does our identity then influence um, how we express things in our culture? So um, first, let's define a couple of things real quickly here. Um, so uh, starting with the self-concept. What is our self-concept? It's just a relatively stable set of ideas that you hold to be true about yourself. So we're not going to go too far down this rabbit trail, but but relatively stable, meaning it can change. It's it's resistant to change. The self-concept is, but it's usually fairly stable over time, periods of time. And then um, but it can change over time, certainly. So and it's a set of ideas that you hold to be true about yourself. So, it's you know, uh, and, and I want to note here, too, it doesn't say that are absolutely objectively true about you. These are things that, that you think are true about you, whether other people think they are or not, whether they are actually true or not, is less important than the fact that you think they're true about yourself. So the self-concept is about what you think, how you see yourself. So the relatively stable set of ideas that you hold to be true about yourself. So uh, just essentially, if I were to ask you to write down, for example, five things that are true about you, if you made a list, five things are true that are true about me. Right? And, uh, and on that list, you might put, I am tall. I have dark hair. I am a good basketball player. I am loyal. I am a Lord of the Rings fan, whatever, you know, whatever you're thinking about yourself to be true. That's your self-concept, whatever would be on that list. And it's more than five things, you know, but, uh, but whatever is on that list, if you were thinking about who am I and you wrote it down on that list, that's essentially your self-concept, the relatively stable set of ideas that you hold to be true about yourself. Now, then we get them beyond that. A lot of times we, we start to use the same terminology for, for some different things, but it's not that they're the same thing. So our self-concept is actually different um, from self-esteem because then we, we could go beyond that and say, okay, these th are the things that I see is true about me, but how do I feel about those things then? Right? Those things that if, I, if after you make your list, if you look at each of those items and you say, okay, I think that's a good thing. I like that about me, or I think that's a, something I wish I could change, or, you know, I just don't care about that. Um, and note that these things can change over time, but, but that's our self-esteem, right? The self-concept are those things that we listed. It says, this is true about me. Our self-esteem then goes one step beyond that and says, how do I feel about each of these things? How do I feel about them? How do they make me feel about myself? So self-esteem then is the value that we place on the attributes that we perceive to make up our self-concept. So again, what value do we place on them? You know, how do we think about them? When I was, uh, you know, if I were to say, okay, I am, uh, you know, I'll just come around and say, I don't know if you can tell, but I'm losing my hair. My hair is, is thinning. It's it's not just starting to go. It is virtually gone, right? And uh, so, and I just cut my hair, so it's really short right now. But um, but it's it's. I mean, you know, I'm losing my hair now. I will tell you, I used to have a long, uh, luscious hair, right down to the middle of my back. No joke. I used to have really long hair in college, and uh, so the value that I've placed on my hair though has changed over time. Uh, you know, I could look at my hair and say, okay, my hair is short. My hair is uh, brown. You can't really see it, but it's graying. It's kind of getting some pepper in there, but um, but it's it's or some salt and pepper. But uh, so it's graying. It's balding. And if you would have asked me 15 years ago, and I said my hair is thinning, I would have been in a panic, right? It would have been I would have been desperate to see what I could do to change that. And now, if you ask me about it, my self-esteem would say it would still be on my list. My hair is thinning. I really don't care. 
You know what I mean? I, I cut my hair short. It's kind of convenient. I don't have to worry about it. I don't spend a lot of money on shampoo or hair products, right? That's nice. Uh, I can cut my own hair now because I keep it simple like this. And so, I mean, you know, I feel okay about it now. If you'd asked me though, 10, 15 years ago, I would have said, oh man, it's an issue. It's a problem. I'm really concerned about it and I don't feel good about it. So our self-concept says this is true about me. Our self-esteem then says, how do I feel about that? What do I think about it? Right. Um, and again, those things can change over time. Our self-esteem, our self-concept can change over time, how what we see happening or what we how we see ourselves, but also our self-esteem, how we feel about those things that are part of our self-concept. OK, so self-esteem, self-concept, those are different things than even self-awareness, just being you know cognizant of who we are in the first place. Being able to list those things at all is kind of a self-awareness thing. But uh, um, so. Okay, now we've got some basic terminology, right? So let's start to explore, though, how these things, self-identity, our self-concept, our self-esteem, and, and just our uh, perception of who we are affects our <clears throat> culture and is affected by culture then. So first, it's important to note that identities are created by communication. Okay, we need to recognize that, that we, uh, our identity is, is formed by communication because, uh, I mean, how do we figure out who we are? We figure it out by, you know, other people telling us. You know, you're, you're handsome, you're smart, you're, you're good at this, you're bad at that, whatever. But people tell us that uh, and pe how people react to us uh, when we're doing different things, when we say different things. Um, identities are created by communication and the way that we engage and interact with others. That's how we know who we are. They, they provide that sort of mirror for us. Okay. Uh, identities are also created in spurts. They don't happen all at once. We may go through long periods of time where they are essentially idle and they're the same. They're stagnant, right? They're relatively stable. Then there may be periods where we change a lot. Think about when you were an adolescent, right? Uh, middle school in particular, I can tell you for me, it was a time of great change. The way I saw myself changed a great deal in middle school and, and then it stayed kind of stable for a little while. And then it changed again later in high school and then it changed again in college and so forth. You know, so it happens in these spurts and then it'll, so it'll kind of, happen you know, in spurts and then kind of remain relatively stable. So identities are created in spurts, though. We have these periods of, of, uh, of great uh, uh, activity in changing and developing our identity and then um, longer periods of just uh, um, where it's kind of static. Most people develop multiple identities, as we were talking about. You develop multiple identities. Now, again, this is not a, a diagnostic thing. We're not talking about a, you know, a psychological issue. We're talking about you know, you're different at work, maybe, than you are at home. Not, not that you're literally a different person. This isn't Mad Men, right? Where you got, you know, Don Draper taken on somebody else's identity. Oh, spoiler alert. Sorry, but that's an old show. I don't feel responsible for that. Um, so, but, but we're talking about, you know, when I'm at work, I talk about work things and I use a particular language related to work. And then when I come home, I don't use necessarily the same terminology with my family because they're not in that world. And so they wouldn't understand it. But, and I'm just, you know, I'm different at work. And, you know, my wife and kids will note that uh, if you ask them, my voice changes when I'm talking on the phone or when I'm teaching in particular, because uh, I'm, I'm a professor. That's what I do for my job. And so they'll say when I'm in class or when I'm speaking on a, on a topic and, and talking about communication, my voice changes. So the voice you're hearing now, my wife and kids would say that is not your regular speaking voice. And in, in fairness, I, I used to work in radio, so I do probably have a, a different voice that I've developed for these types of things uh, in order to try and be more effective in that regard. But uh, anyway, my voice changed. So I, I have multiple identities and we have different identities. You, you'll be, you might be different. You might be a totally just kind of a, what people would consider just kind of a regular, normal person. And then you go to a, a comic book convention and you take on this entirely different personality, maybe literally, but right? you dress up as your favorite character or whatever, but you may just become a kid. I love amusement parks and, and again, my family always cracks up every time we go to an amusement park, they tell me that I giggle like I'm, like I'm 12 years old anytime we're on a roller coaster. I, I don't notice it, but I have a different identity apparently when I'm in an amusement park, I become a, I revert to, to childhood and, and because I love doing that. So we have these multiple identities and this is a part of who we are. Okay. Um, now identities may be assigned or they may be voluntarily assumed. Okay. What that means is some identities we may have a chance just to choose whether we take them on you know i chose to be a fan of of roller coasters nobody forced that on me nobody forces me to be different nobody forces me to take on a different identity at work um it's just something i do because i think it'll it'll help convey the information and be more effective in my job and things so um so nobody forces that on me there are times when, when somebody may have an identity assigned to them in a sense right that uh uh in the sense that um 
maybe because of your position at work, you, you, you are required to be the tough one, right? That are the, you know, the, the hard case you're required to crack the whip and do things like that. Um, because of your responsibilities at work, um, we could look at childhood order sometimes. And, and you could say that those are kind of assigned in a sense that, uh, older kids are oftentimes expected to help take care of their younger siblings. So their identity becomes as like a, a pseudo parent in a sense. And so, I mean, and maybe not, may not be intentional or expressed outwardly like that, but, uh, uh, explicitly, but you know, we just kind of do those things sometimes. So it may be assigned to us, uh, but it could be voluntarily assumed. It just depends on the identity and what's happening. And, in, and lastly, it's important to note that identities are developed differently in different cultures uh, because cultures are different. Identities are developed differently. Some cultures have the, uh, the uh, luxury, uh, you know, you have the luxury of kind of uh, developing your own identity and, and voluntarily assuming a lot more things. In other cultures, you know, it may be a little more rigid in terms of, no, this is what you're expected to do. And so your identity becomes, am I, am I completing that? Am I doing that? Or am I um, not doing that? And in which case I feel like an outsider and feel like I'm, um, you know, there's, that there's something wrong with me, whereas in a different culture, it might be totally normal. So, but different cultures have different expectations and different ideas of what should happen, of course. And so as a result, these identities then that are developed are going to be different depending on the culture that you're in. Okay. So the process of developing those identities is different in different cultures. And then obviously the actual identities are different in different cultures because, um, because those cultures are different. They have different expectations. Okay. I want to talk briefly just about the different types of identities real quickly. So um, there are three different types of identities we could, we, that we kind of categorize these in uh, as far as our conversation is concerned. There are personal identities, right, um, where um, these are the ones we kind of uh, have to ourselves. They're individual for us, right, like maybe being, um, so for example, a fan of a particular type of music it doesn't require us to join a group or do, you know, we can just, I can be a fan of that band or that musician on my own. I don't need anybody else to do that. And, and I can still participate in that culture, right? Um, I am not a Swifty. I will, I will admit to that. But if I were, I could still be a Swifty and not have to be a part of the larger group. I could call myself a Swifty even, right? There's no, though, I could still be a, a Swifty in the comfort of my own home right? Without having to join in, in any other uh, activities or do whatever. So, and these are things that we can just do on our own though. Our personal identities are things that we can um, pursue on our own and enjoy on our own and don't require any other kind of a group. Then there are other kinds of identities that are more social, right? And so social identities are those that um, bring us into a larger group and really um, again, you could do these things on your own, but it's, it's being part of a large group as part of the the culture, right? So, for example, I am a, an enormous fan of the University of Michigan, um, and and uh, and particularly their athletics. Although their academics are wonderful too, but but I, I'm a lifelong Michigan fan um, as far as their athletics go, and that's so why I wear a lot of Michigan gear when when we're out. I wear a Michigan baseball cap all the time. Uh, you know, it's a block M. I'm always wearing the block M, uh, and, uh, and and and. My wife comments every time we go out, she almost keeps a count. Every time we go out and everywhere we go, how many people, and I do not live in Michigan. I live in Indiana, but I, so I'm not really far away, but I do not live in Michigan. And this is not a highly supportive University of Michigan area, but regardless, anytime we go out, she counts how many times random people just yell at me, go blue, right? Go blue. It's a social thing. You see, so, and if I see somebody wearing a black camera, I got to say, go blue to them. It's just part of who we are as a fan base. It is a social thing. We gather, I mean, 110,000 people get together in the big house every Saturday that they're playing in the fall, right? It's a social thing. It's part of a, a larger uh, identity is being part of that fan base and, uh, and being in competition with our rivals like Ohio State, Michigan State. Um, that's part of it as well. So, I mean, there's, there's this kind of contra uh, culture that's happening there. It's a social thing, though, really. It's, it's a larger thing. And then we have our cultural identities. What are the expectations that our culture places on us? What are the things that we are expected to do as part of our larger society? Um, and, you know, there are different definitions of what that mean, would mean, but what are the cultural expectations placed on us and how does that shape our identities and how are we fitting into that or how are we rejecting that and going out on our own and, and uh, so all of those things. Okay. All right. So as you may recall from our conversation on uh, defining culture and what is culture, part of culture is um, that, that, you know, the purpose of culture is, is, is that it's a sense of how we um, identify 
one group from another, or distinguish one group from another, identify who's part of this group or that group. And, uh, and so just a, as a brief recap, we have what we call in-groups and out-groups, right? So out-groups are, are basically any group that you're not a part of. So the person on the left here, the stick finger on the left, that, that's the, the, all the people in that circle. That's an out-group for them because they're not part of it, right? So that's an out-group, essentially. Anything that you are not a part of, if you would say them instead of us, um, then if you would say them, that would indicate typically that it's an out group. You're not part of that group. It's it's something um, separate from you. But an in group then is simply, you know, if that person were to move into that group and become part of that circle, then that would be an in group for them. Okay. So in group would be anything you would say we or us, right? Uh, if you would refer to it as we or us as though you are a part of it, that's an in group for you. Okay. So along with that then means that, that, that it's a way that we distinguish one group from another and that creates, in essence, an idea of difference and then uh, this idea of sameness as well. So uh, let's let's talk about that a little bit. So uh, first thing we need to talk about is stereotypes. And to be clear, um, stereotypes are not inherently bad. OK, stereotypes just essentially mean that it's so our mind psychologically when we're, when in terms of perception, we're trying to group things in our, 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 our brain and our, our perception tries to do us a favor by saying, OK, basically, I've seen this before, um, so I kind of have an idea of what this is and who that is and, and tries to help us process things more quickly by placing things into these categories. Right now, we can take that to an extreme, though, when we start to make assumptions that all, that everything that kind of seems similar to that category must be the same. Right. Because that's not the case. Um, so, for example, even though. So my, my grandparents had a farm when I was growing up and you could go out and they had cows and uh, and, you know, you go out and you'd see a cow. Right. So, I mean, the cow, a lot of their cows looked the same, right? different spot. They had Holstein, so the different different uh, color patterns and things. So but you would go out and um, you could see these these cows and say, OK, that's a cow. I basically understand what a cow is. I, I, you know, my mind is telling me that's a cow. That's an animal. It's, it's this type of animal. And and uh, it's, it's going to behave in this way. And I can expect it to do this. And, you know, it helps us work with the cattle and things. But uh, but of course, if you've worked with any kind of animal, you know that animals absolutely have their own personalities, right? Their own types of personality. So some of the cows were very nice, very kind, very gentle. And others were a little more, um, they had a little more character. How about that? We'll, we'll put it that way. They were a little more stubborn or a little, you know, different. So it would be a mistake for me to walk in there and say, okay, this is a cow and all cows behave the same way. And so I can, I know what to expect when I walk up to this cow. Most cows are going to, you know, be pretty docile and do what you expect them to do when, when they're accustomed to that. But again, some of them aren't, and I need to be able to identify, okay, this cow is different. And so stereotyping would not be doing me a favor in that instance, because it wouldn't allow me to distinguish between um, the different cows and understand that this cow could present a danger to me. Okay. Um, so, that's, you know, stereotypes aren't, again, inherently bad. They're just basically clarifying or classifying things for us. But we can't fall into the um, mistake of assuming that everything is the same then just because it kind of may fall into that same category. These categories are too broad and we need to individualize more. Okay? So we need to be cautious with stereotypes and not take them to an extreme. And then we also need to uh, avoid prejudice, of course. And this is kind of stereotyping on steroids, prejudices. When we assume um, negative things about about a person based on either experiences that we've had or or an understanding that we may have or knowledge that we may have or at least think we have about uh, a person or a group of people right that, that we then assign that to an individual person right so um you know you could do this with cows but i think i've kind of beaten that example to death but uh, so let's just take another animal right let's just say dogs for example and, and so people have legitimate fears of dogs i understand that and, and it's not this is not a criticism of that but um but if you've had a bad experience with a dog you know it's fair that you're going to be cautious and be be wary and be maybe be afraid of dogs uh, but there are lots of good dogs out there right there are plenty of good dogs most dogs are good um so it's kind of prejudicing against them to uh, to not afford them the same opportunities. Right? So obviously there are larger societal impacts of this. And we see this a lot with, I'm um, just, you know, one clear example is with uh, minorities. Um, you know, pick any minority that you like and you'll see lots of prejudice when we uh, have an, an idea of what that minority is like as, as somebody from the non-minority class, I guess I'm saying this. So, um, you know, it's historically that's been the case that we look at, again, we stereotype a group and then we take it one step beyond that and say, well, 
because of this, I'm going to behave in a negative way, or I'm going to treat them differently and not afford them the same opportunities uh, because of my feelings about that group or my experiences with someone from that group, not even that group as a whole, but maybe just someone uh, who may look the same or be from the same area or whatever, right? I mean, there's lots of things. That, so again, stereotyping, not always bad. Prejudice is and it's virtually always bad. I mean, it's, it has, you know, negative connotations all, all the way around. We need to, uh, to uh, be cautious of that. We also, though, need to be uh, wary of assumed similarity. We can't just assume that everybody is the same as us. That's a tendency in communication. We, we tend to assume that other people are like us. Right? We want to be cautious of that as well because you know, nobody's the same as us, and they may be different just because we assume similarities. I used to share an office with a guy uh, who was very active in local um, democratic politics, right? And uh, so we shared an office and it was great. And he had some friends that would come in and he had friends from, you know, this is local politics. So it's, it's all pretty friendly. So there were, he had very close friends who were both Republicans and Democrats and they would come in. They all worked with us. They would come in and they would all just talk politics. Again, some Republican, some Democrat. I'm just, you know, they're across the room or whatever. And I'm friendly or whatever, but I'm not getting too involved. And then they would also come in, though, when my office mate wasn't there to see if he was there. And if he wasn't, they would start talking to me and they would assume both sides would assume that that I was on their side. They assume that, hey, you know, Josh is he's a, he's a you know, a, a logical, reasonable person. So obviously he must agree with me and be a Democrat or must agree with me and be a Republican. Right. Until one day we're in the office and my office mate is there and we're having a conversation. And one of them says to me, right, Josh will help. Josh will support me on this. Right. And can my office mate said, why would he support you on that? He's not a he's not a Democrat. Uh, and the other guy said, yeah, I know he's a Republican. I said, he can, and my office mate said, he's not a Republican either. He's, he's a libertarian. And they were both shocked. They said, we just assumed that you were, uh, you know, uh, both of them assumed that I was on their side. And I said, nah, not really. I just, you know, I don't really fall into either party. So, uh, but we do that. We assume that others are like us. So we, we have to be cautious of that as well. Not make assumptions uh, about similarities. Uh, that's really important in culture. Right? When we have people from different cultures, you can't just assume that everybody's going to be the same as us. Right? Speaking of which, when we go into a different culture, it's possible that we may then experience culture shock. This fact that the people are not the same as us, that people may be different than us when we go to different cultures. Maybe it's in big ways, maybe it's in small ways, but but it can lead to what we call a culture shock, which is literally just what it sounds like. It's this uh, like when somebody dumps a bucket of cold water on you and you just got that frozen feeling like, oh my gosh, what's happening here? You kind of get locked up a little bit. That's culture shock, essentially, right? We get, just get overwhelmed by the differences in what we maybe assumed are, are we're going to be similarities or just we weren't expecting it to be quite so different or whatever. So we go through culture shock and it's not unusual to, to have that happen. And people have studied this over the years and we've looked at culture shock and, and determined there are maybe different stages. Um, so there are a couple of different ways of looking at this. So just to, to, to show you briefly what those are. One um, model of culture shock is called a U curve model. Uh, as you can see, it's it's like a U, right? Where we start in a honeymoon phase um, where when we first get into a culture, everything is magical. Everything is so interesting and just you know, it's funny, you walk around a new city or you walk around a different country and you're just entranced by how cool everything is, how different everything is. And you have this honeymoon phase, right? But eventually, if you're there long enough, you're going to start to feel like, oh, yeah, this is different. In fact, it's really different. In fact, I am not certain about it. I don't know how to behave here. So you have this uncertainty and doubt that creeps in. And uh, and just, so it starts to, to uh, dip. Your emotional state will start to dip. You'll start to get really anxious about this. And uh, but eventually... If you're there long enough, you will uh, yeah, adapt and get into this the other top side here of acceptance, where you start to feel more comfortable. Okay, I can tell you when I was in, when I was in high school, I had the opportunity to live in Spain for a summer, and this is absolutely what happened. When I got there; everything was magical, and it didn't take too long for me to feel like, oh man, what a, what did I do? What am I doing here? Right? I got into that uncertainty and doubt phase. Fortunately, I lived with an incredible family, I had an amazing family, and they were really patient and really helpful. And, and so my adaptation time was really uh, accelerated because of that. And I did move into acceptance to the point where when I got home, uh, or even when I was on the phone with my parents, uh, when I would call home, the, the couple times that I called home, and my mom would have to stop me and say, Josh, stop, 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 stop. And I'd say, what? And she'd say, I don't speak Spanish. And I'd say, yeah, I know. And she'd say, well, you're speaking Spanish. I'd already, you know, just in my mind clicked into, 
speaking Spanish all the time. And I was dreaming in Spanish, which was kind of cool. Uh, when I got home, my friends were really kind of weirded out by my lack of personal space because <laughs> they were used to more personal space. When I got, you know, acclimated and uh, living there, the, my sense of personal space shrunk. And so my friends were constantly saying, dude, you've got to take a step back from me. So you you, you adapt, you, you learn to accept these things. So play in a, in a, if you're interculturally competent, that's the idea. You, if, if, and if you don't, then you're stuck in that uncertainty and doubt. And you're probably not going to stay there as long. Right? Um, so anyway, that's the U-curve model. Another model says, well, it's not really that. It's more complicated than that. It's really more of um, a W, right? You have that honeymoon phase, and then you have the culture shock that sets in and takes you down to the lower level of comfort, of course. And then you have an initial adjustment where you kind of rebound and get back up there. But then you may start to feel isolated a little bit, right? Uh, when you when you uh, realize, man, this is going on longer, and, and these people aren't necessarily the same as me. My culture is different. And you start to realize that, but then eventually, again, you may you know, hopefully get into that acceptance in a in an integration phase. So it's a W, it's up and down and up and down and up again. Right? That's the W. But the truth is, most modern uh, studies would tell you that uh, that while these are both helpful and and in understanding intercultural communication, um, they're not really totally accurate. And the truth is that we don't really know. We don't really know what's happening here, right? We don't really. There's no set model. It all depends on so many different variables, the person and the culture, and how, how different is it actually? And, uh, you know, we're more likely to acclimate uh, quickly when we move to a different town, you know, that's 20 minutes away. That'll be culture shock, but at a lower level. And if you're more accustomed to that, right? If you're somebody who's okay with that ambiguity and really likes that kind of adventure, that'll affect it as well. So there's no real set pattern uh, for culture shock necessarily. Uh, most, I think most modern studies would, would say that, um, that it's, you know, the U curve and the W curve were kind of helpful in setting that initial stage. But the truth is, it just kind of depends. Depends so much on so many different things, right? So, um, so we got to keep that in mind. All right. So what do we do here? Well, how do we do this? How do we develop intercultural competence? How do we develop this uh, intercultural communication competence? Well, there are really three important um, stages that we're going to look at. Um, there are three important you know, concepts for doing that. Um, the first is that we have to foster attitudes that motivate us. Uh, we have to have the right attitude okay, um, to, to be open to these things, to be open to exploring these different cultures. And then we also have to um, discover knowledge that informs us. We have to become knowledgeable about that culture. We have to, to dig in and really learn about that culture so we, so we have the information that we need to be able to adapt and to be able to understand what's happening there. And then finally, we develop these skills right, that are going to be important for enabling us to accept and integrate into that culture. Okay? So again, our attitudes set the stage for all of these things. Our attitudes will affect our willingness to learn new things and our willingness to develop skills and uh, and just our willingness to be a part of those cultures. And, and so our attitude, our mindset has to be in the proper space for that. Then we develop the knowledge uh, of that culture so we can learn about it and uh, learn what it's going to take for us to um, uh, to be a part of that culture, to integrate into it, and to uh, if that's something we're going to do. Right? And then we need to work at developing the skills, just like we would anything else. If you wanted to become a better free throw shooter in basketball, you know, you need to work at it. You need to develop the right skills, the right uh, kind of stance and the right um, hand positions and the right kind of wrist motion in your shooting hand and those types of things. You'd work on those skills. The same is true in inter intercultural communication. You have to, to work at the skills that are going to be important to integrating into that culture and learn to make those part of our kind of our muscle memory in a sense. So hopefully you can see now how closely intertwined identity is with culture. Um, all of these things are really um, intertwined with our and, and and such a critical aspect of culture. And, then, and so again, culture influences our identity. Certainly our identity is formed in part based on uh, our culture, but identity also will inform our culture and will, will influence our culture, will influence you know, if I see myself as a, as a sci-fi fan, then I am more likely to embrace the culture of Lord of the Rings and Star Trek and Star Wars and so forth. And if I'm, if I'm not a sci-fi fan, if that's not part of my identity, then I'm less likely to want to be a part of that culture and, and to embrace that culture, right? So these things are really closely intertwined, um, identity and culture, and they're really important uh, to one another. If you have questions about 
you know, your identity and culture and, and how all of that works together, please feel free to email me. I'd love to hear from you in, in, in that way. In the meantime, I hope this helps you have a better understanding of what it means um, to have a culture, what it means to, uh, to identify something within ourselves, to have that self-concept and self-esteem, and then how it does influence our culture and, of course, vice versa.